the 70s were hot, everything was great, but the early 80s business in the AWA was pretty much the biggest ever, right? Adnan El Casey got a hot group, Crusher was still over after 30 years in the business, and Hogan comes in and Hulkamania gets started. And for, once again, for the people who think Hulkamania was created in the WWF, that's not the case. They were using the term, what, in 82, 1, 2 there in the AWA? Well, I, I wrestled in Shea Stadium, 19, what was it, 78? When Bruno and Zabisco 1980. Had 1980, 1980, and Hogan wrestled Andre, and I went out after the match with Pat Patterson and Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood. Go back to the room, and there's Hogan sitting down on the floor, almost in tears. I said, "Man, what's the matter, big man? I can't make it." And I said, "Hey, you just need some help. You need some training. You got to find out, figure out who you are." Yeah. Well, what do you mean by that? And I said, "Well, come to the AWM. We'll, we'll show you." So it took him about three months to finally call, and I told my dad about him. He said, hey, this Hogan called. What do you think? I said, well, he's got tremendous potential, but he needs a lot of work. So we were doing the Phil Donahue show in Chicago, and Hogan drove up, and he stopped in Chicago, and he came on at the end of the show to do an interview, and it was the worst freaking interview I'd ever heard in my life. <laughs> and my dad went and looked at me. And he I, re says, I remember his rookie remember? interviews. Oh, yeah, and yeah, my yeah. dad goes, are you kidding me? I said, well, look at him. So we had him in Milwaukee that Saturday, and I went out and watched his match. They had put Johnny Valiant with him because he couldn't talk. And I said, you know, the damnedest thing, Valiant has always been a heel there, but they walked out and they cheer Hogan. Yeah. He's a baby face. He said, well, let me talk with him. So he talked to him and kind of got his personality. And he says, well, hey, you're not a heel, man. You got to learn who you are and be you. So Vern took the uh, Rocky movie where Hogan... Uh, hit Rocky, and Rocky hit the mat, and he looked up at him. We'd show him that part, just showing how big Hogan yeah. was, and let him do a little interview. He got him posing and doing that, and then he had Jim and I work out with him in the daytime, and then at night, he'd put him in six-man tags with us, and we'd only get him in the ring when we had control, you know, get Nick's arm, he'd, you know, twist the arm, drop a leg on it, tag out. And then he started getting the feel for it and the flow of the match. And, Timing, and then it how long back. to take and how long to mill. Right. Chicago, we jumped in the ring there at the Rosemont uh, place was jammed and Hogan did his pose and I said, Jim, grab his t-shirt. We just grabbed sight of his t-shirt and tore it off slow and <laughs> people went, and that's how he got to tear that off. I love it. But um, he just had to be brought along and we brought him along and then, uh, you know, he stuck it to us. Well, but before he did, it was some record oh, business. Shit. It it, and, and I remember Lawler was going up to, to work for your dad at the time, and he would make Minneapolis, St. Paul, and come out. There was 19,000 people in St. Paul, and the overflow was in closed circuit. That yeah. period, the, you know, once again, it was there, there were there were no Comiskey Park shows uh, of 30,000 people, but the St. Paul was to. doing 20-something oh, thousand yeah. with, the, with the overflow. Um, do you think overall... Baby faces in the history of the AWA, not named Ganya, mm -hmm. was the biggest draws was a Crusher and Hogan. Yeah, biggest box office. Yeah, yeah. We we touched on it earlier, but all good things must come to an end. And that run, starting in 1984, when Vince uh, spirited away Hogan yeah. uh, in in the middle of the night, and then. Hogan obviously had the pull because Vince wanted to build around him, so he had the pull to say, well, I want this guy, and I, this guy interviews me well, this guy bumps for me well, this guy puts me over well, and I like to have this guy around, and they all well, what, go what, away. What happened is we always ran our uh, battle royals. We got Andre from Vince Sr. every October, so October 1st, September. Uh, August started picking up for us. September, school started, eh, it was so-so. October, from there to April 30th was huge business. That's where we did all our business. So we'd bring Andre in on October 1st and kick off the Battle Royals. And we'd, we'd run about, that's when we'd run hard. We'd run 30 days. We'd yeah. run every night. With the winner, then Thanksgiving, we'd meet Bach, or whoever the champion was. Well, in St. Paul, uh, it just happened. It was an accident. Uh, there was about five guys left in the ring, and Andre had thrown somebody out, and he backed up, and he backed right into Hogan. And they just kind of turned and looked yeah. at each other, and the place went... Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. there you go. They were just waiting for something. So Vern said, okay, that's it. He called Vince the next day, said, Vince Sr., I got to get, get Andre for February, the whole month of February. Okay, you got him. So Hogan was going to Japan, uh, and we had our Thanksgiving match, 
and then we were booked Christmas Christmas night in St. Paul, and then we had San Francisco, Chicago, Milwaukee, Winnipeg, Denver, all going. All sold out, and we had Hogan and six-man tag team matches with us, and it was every place was sold out. The 19th of December, Vern gets a telegram. What, what Vern was going to do in February was book Hogan and Andre, and Andre yeah. all the way around our cities, and then in April, drop the belt to him. But he didn't. He doesn't. He never told anybody this right. because he didn't want it out there. Telephone, everybody. telegraph, telegraph. Right, you know. They would have known. Right. Yeah. So Vern was always really tight-lipped about what we were doing. So he gets this telegram from Tampa, Florida. Uh, I'm not coming back. And Vern says, "Tampa, Florida, it's fucking Eddie Graham." <laughs> because they used to rib each other yeah. all the time. So he figures it's a rib, so he throws it away. So we get to St. Paul that night. No Hogan. And I called him, and he was home, and he answered. So I said, what are you doing? We got the matches. Oh, I quit. Didn't you get the telegram? I said, what telegram? He told me. I said, well, maybe for him, he thought Eddie Graham sent it. He thought it was a joke. He said, no, I'm not coming back. That's the way he gives notice? I'm not coming back unsigned? Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> then one didn't say anything. Okay. Right? So I said, hey, if you want to go somewhere else, go. But fulfill your commitment. Just finish these, these dates. I mean, we're... They're sold out. You can't do that. That isn't the way to do business. And I said, you know, Vern had some big plans for you down the road. Well, I've already made my decision. You should have talked to me earlier. I said, he talked to you in Phoenix and told you that they were bringing Andre back in February and we were going to, yeah. you know, have this big match. Well, Andre flew to Japan with them and convinced them Vince was doing this big thing and Vince flew over there and made the deal. So that was that. He never so came back. Within what was it? Less than six months, you'd lost him. You'd lost Ventura. He took David Schultz just to just a, bounce for yeah, him. Yeah, that wasn't a big loss. But, but, but I'm, but I'm, but, I'm you know, saying but he, they had the thing going. That's the thing. He took his own TV he, announcer, his own opponent, his own partner, his Gene own Oakland, everybody. Took, yeah, right. So now you've got the talent you made coming back in to work and it, at that point he was also trying to snatch up the TV time slots because he got to St. Louis. He did he have right, many of yours? He, he walked right into uh, Minneapolis. Stu Schwartz who ran the TV station, a good friend of ours. His father was my dad's good friend and they got back in the uh, in the early 60s on TV with them and they were then the kid took over and he was still you know good friends. He said Vince walked in with a briefcase of $250,000. He said here this is yours. Put our TV on in Vern's time slot. And he's one of the few guys that didn't do it. Jesus Christ. San Francisco, we had our first, we, it took us three years to build the market up. We had our first big sellout coming in. And six weeks before, uh, we're down in St. Louis in a meeting with Bill Watts, Crockett's, and all of them, they're getting their USA Wrestling deal going. Yeah. And Vern gets a, a call from San Francisco. We'd bartered the time. He said, hey, uh, I'm taking your TV off. Uh, he said, what do you mean you're taking our TV off? We just sent you all the tapes for the next six weeks. He said, uh, I'm putting McMahon in there. He's paying me uh, $2,000 a week. So Vern said, okay, I'll pay you 2500 So it got up to like 3500 four grand, I think was our last bid. And he says, okay, you're in. He says, we're done? Yep, you're in. Good. And all of a sudden, we run the card, and our TV show had never been on. The tapes came back after that, and the guy said, Vince gave me five grand a week. <laughs> I, at that point, and really, it already, you, he made an experiment with Jumbo Theruda as champion mm -hmm. for a while. But that was uh, because of Bob, our connection with Bob. And, right, yeah. for a Japanese deal. And, yeah. and you know, Bob you know had that done goes. that years before right. with the NWA title. But. With the exception of Nick, all of a sudden, the, the champions, I, I don't want to say take a disturbing turn, but it didn't it seem did. AWA-like. Rick Martel, right. great yeah. worker, well, that didn't was, seem AWA-like. You, know, you, know, you know who sold that one? was Nick. He wanted Rick. He wanted to drop Because he had Rick. a nice baby face to work with, and he was athletic. He was, but, but he didn't have the... I didn't, you know, I I didn't see Rick Martel that, uh, getting I over in Rick. Green Bay at a bar, no. right? <laughs> no, he got over with the girls, but he didn't have the, uh, the, the, the men didn't buy it. Yeah. You know, they want, I don't know, he was too pretty. Well, but then, he just didn't have the charisma. And I don't like to say that because I, I love Rick to death. He was great in the ring, but, you know, it didn't yeah. work. 
You then you got one that the men would believe in, and he wasn't too pretty, but that didn't work out. Stan Hansen. Oh, Stan was a handful. He would have worked out. He just didn't listen. He didn't want to. He didn't want to listen. The the guys that had at that point, and I was going, th we were going through it down south with some of our opponents would mm -hmm. get Japanese deals, mm -hmm. where they'd be gone for a month and they were making big money per week. But it, you know, that's why we never went because we were always figured in, right. and it wouldn't have been that much more money than we were already making at home. Well, if but you're a champion, you, when you Bubba had to paid him pretty good. Yeah. Well, obviously. You know, yeah. So but, Stan used that for his deal over there. As a single and and a top guy like that. But it just, it was hard to keep a championship on somebody that somebody. whose first loyalty yeah, you, was somebody you know, else. I mean, Shawn Michaels, I found Shawn and Marty Jannetty put them together. You know, once they got established, uh, boom, you know. Every yeah. time you worked your ass off to get somebody established, Vince would grab them. You couldn't hang on to them. But then you actually, you ended up, after Nick took the belt and put it on Kurt Henning, you ended up with a guy who was an updated, souped-up version of an old-time AWA yeah, wrestler. He, he was, was physically yeah. believable, but his work, with he, he took it to the next level. He was more exciting. Mm -hmm. He got a year's run with it, but at that point, everybody, almost every territory besides Crockett, everybody's business was going downhill. You, were, you, you still had ESPN, and you were, the Pro Wrestling USA thing had not worked out because none of the promoters could right. agree, and uh, the whole thing that we, yeah. we know. But at that point, had you already moved to the showboat in Vegas when Kurt, I think, when yeah. Kurt won the belt? You already yeah. had. You've got the national TV on ESPN. It's more of an arena setting. You've got Kurt. What what was the idea to try and, and compete at that point? Was it more of a you, you couldn't run a full well, we house were, show schedule anymore because no. nobody was going to house shows. We were making we were making money on the TV. Yeah. The showboat was paying us and ESPN was paying us, and uh, that's why we could keep. That's the only way we could keep going. Yeah. And uh, you know ESPN wanted us to incorporate new talent and try to get you know steal people from McMahon, but you you know. <laughs> Slaughter final steal left people to make money. Yeah, steal something yeah. from Fort Knox while yeah, you're at you, it. Yeah, it's uh, their contracts are indentured servitude at that point. Uh, oh, hey, one yeah. thing I did forget to tell you. Okay, and this was big, and nobody knew about it but Vern and I. And this happened uh, when we got Andre for February. Yeah, CBS had come to us, and they were going to put us on the network every quarter. We had to have Hogan, and the first match we were going to have was Hogan and Andre in February. Hogan didn't know about that because Hogan and Andre on network television that could work and, and it it uh, it would have kicked off our, our event for for CBS and we didn't tell him because we just had locked it up just before Christmas and he was going to tell Hogan after he got back so how's that for a little kick in the ball that the history of wrestling yeah that would have changed the whole thing a little different